Hello, friends. Welcome to Investment Immigration Conversations. I'm your host, Carolyn Lee, principal and founder of Carolyn Lee PLLC, a U.S. investment immigration law firm dedicated to helping clients build their futures with investment immigration. And boy, are we doing that. Uh, today, we're going to talk about just some of my thoughts, reflections, highlights um, from the recent IIUSA conference in Atlanta. Um, it was a it was a, a very good gathering. Um, the mood was positive. Everyone was busy. There was a sense of folks um, coming back alive, and. There was also a sense, um, I, I would say, of a little bit of underlying anxiety about what's coming next. You know, things have been really good. The, the new law, the EB-5 Reform and Integrity Act of 2022, did its job very, very well. It brought the program back to life. It's brought investors back into the program. It's reinvigorated U.S. projects and regional centers, raising EB-5 capital for incredible projects around the country, but we're nearing the halfway mark toward the end of the reauthorization that the RIA gave us. And the program again sunsets in September 30 of 2027. And so whether or not that, um, that date was, you know, was concrete to everyone, there was, there was a sense, I think, of, well, you know, What's next? What 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 now? And so we're gonna kind of try to unpack that a little bit as we talk about um, what I think are the are the key takeaways and and next steps for us in the EB five community. Um, so key highlights topic of discussion, um, of course, was about visa numbers usage. You know that was a that was a key key topic. And we were very lucky to have at the conference from the U.S. State Department, Dr. Michael Hanley, who shared some data with us. And I must say, um, I had a chance to ask a couple of questions after the presentation, a very, very nice um, gentleman. And I think that's in keeping with the tradition of officials at the State Department handling visa affairs and liaisoning with the community. Um, this goes back to Steve Fischel, um, whom I, I think I had the great pleasure of meeting at a flight to an American Immigration Lawyers Association conference when I was a very junior attorney. And um, I was pouring over the materials, you know, then we had these booklets. And, um, and he kind of said, you know, immigration attorneys, you guys just, you know, work really hard. You, you really care about this stuff. And uh, he really um, had that sense of appreciation for the bar. And I think that's carried over. It's been a tradition that his mentees, including Charlie Oppenheim and Jeff Gorski and others have really um, carried on in the State Department. Uh, and, and I'm pleased to report that Dr. Hanley is in that tradition. And so um, the numbers usage, right? We've had a lot of data as a result of AIIA's FOIA litigation. And, um, and of course, it's not entirely transparent. The data cuts off. We don't have, you know, at the end of November, 2023, um, and, we, and the data itself is incomplete. We don't know, for example, how many dependents are also in queue associated with those petitions. And that's, that's really important to assess um, demand. So, um, what we learned as a, as a highlight that I think is very, very important um, is that in terms of the unreserved numbers for fiscal 2024, we are told that there are over 8,000 numbers that have already been used in fiscal 2024, which ends September 30, 2024. So um, there's a graphic uh, in the slides that Dr. Hanley shared, which shows that 6,366 EB-5 visas from the unreserved category have already been used, have already been 
um, disseminated. And 1,995, about 2,000 visas have been allocated to adjustment of status applicants. So that's over 8,000 of the a little over 14,000 or over 14,000 visas that we have in the unreserved category in fiscal 2024 as a result of the carryovers. So at this point, let me just share very briefly, I hope it's up. Um, one of my favorite slides, yeah. Um, which kind of has my analysis on this. Okay, on supply this year. And here we are in fiscal 2024. And we have 25,000 more in the employment-based side of immigrant visa numbers because of the unused COVID number, numbers once again, carrying over into employment base, which gives us, if, you, if we just do the math, um, and the carryovers from the unused set-asides from actually fiscal 2022, that's the mechanics of the set-asides rolling over into unreserved, we have 14,360 visas in the unreserved category. That's double the normal number that we would have, the 68%, which would be about 6,758. So we're being told that um, over 8,000 have already been issued in unreserved. And that um, I also heard from um, a very credible source that we're on pace to actually use up all of the unreserved this year. Now that would be phenomenal, but that doesn't quite square with other data that was shared, which shows that very, very, very few visas have actually been issued. Um, so, and, and this is something that, you know, a number of us are kind of scratching our heads about. Um, so this is something that, you know, I'll be, looking more into and talking more about squaring these data sets. On the one hand, all the unreserved 14,000 plus will be used up in fiscal 2024. And on the other hand, it seems like very, very few visas in EB-5 have actually been issued thus far. How do we square that? The other topic, of course, of much discussion and some consternation um, and a lot of controversy is the sustainment policy and what that what that means for everybody. So just to recap, um, USCIS announced at the end of last year a new position on the sustainment requirement um, under its interpretation of the EB-5 Reform and Integrity Act of 2022, applicable to RIA investors only. So free RIA, the sustainment period, is governed by the old policy and two years of conditional residency. So you have to keep your investment sustained until the end of your two years in conditional residency. However, for post RIA, for RIA investors, USCIS has interpreted the RIA to say that there's just a two year investment period. And there has been lawsuit in instituted by Investing USA, IIUSA, and um, there are many investors that who are unhappy about this. Um, so there was some discussion, you know, about that, and, and certainly it was very much in the air and in the backdrop. I'm not going to get into that, other than to simply state the obvious that it is still very much in the air in our community and and unresolved. Another item that we started to talk about, and really, and I think this was sort of kind of feeding that underlying je ne sais quoi, kind of a little bit of anxiety is, uh, and this is related to the, um, the next sunset, September 30, 2027, 
is um, the grandfathering mechanic. So under subparagraph S of the EB-5 Reform and Integrity Act of 2022, um, the, sun, the grandfathering protections somewhat uh, idiosyncratically extend only to petitions filed before September 30, on or before September 30, 2026. Now I'm going to read the language because always the language is super important. That's where we have to start. So it's this is a paragraph S, and it says this is this is the grandfathering provision, right? This is new. Notwithstanding the expiration of the legislation authorizing the regional center program under subparagraph E, the Secretary of Homeland Security shall continue processing petitions under 204A1H. This is the EB-5 petition, the I-526 and I-526E, and 216A, petitions under 216A, are the petition to petitions to remove conditions, the I-829 petition, based on an investment in the new commercial enterprise associated with a regional center that were filed on or before September 30, 2026. So shall continue this injunction to continue to process immigration cases, notwithstanding the sunset or expiration in 2027 is only extended to petitions filed on or before September 30, 2026. So this is another topic that we're going to have, uh, we're going to be having a lot of conversation about unpacking what that means, what the effect is of that. And that it allows me to pivot to looking ahead to what the rest of the lifespan of the RIA um, means for all of us. And this is a topic that I hit on when I had the opportunity to, um, in the opening advocacy panel of the conference, when asked the question, what is the key advocacy priority for us all? And I believe it is permanent reauthorization of the EB-5 program. We've been long conditioned to the sunset and this background anxiety about what next, what now, that has fed in the entire EB-5 ecosystem. If we had a permanent EB-5 program, we would not only remove that layer of doubt and anxiety affecting us all, investors, projects, professionals. But we would also have, this is super, super important, a stable body of law on which all the stakeholders, including our examiners, can rely and grow with. I have often contrasted the program that we have and the um, examination that we experience with the Securities and Exchange Commission examiners and their leadership. Now, um, and I, I was kind of brought into awareness of the contrast because I think it was in 2016, um, USCIS invited the leadership of the SEC examination team in charge of the 33 Act, 34 Act, and the 40 Act to address the EB-5 community. I think this was um, a program in, in San Diego that we were able to um, also dial into if we weren't participating in person. And what struck me was that, was the confidence and the competence the supervisors had over their subject matter in, in a way that we kind of long for, right? We, we talk about this in the EB-5 context. And that is what you have when you have almost a century of living with a statute and the interpretations and the policy and the opinions arising from that very, very stable body of law. And I believe that that is what we very much need in our community. So permanent, permanent reauthorization is something I think we need to work together toward. On that front, the um, I think the working together piece 
is going to be critical, critical. And um, at the risk of sounding a bit, you know, Pollyannish or, or what have you, it's practical. Um, I have been attending meetings about EB-5 legisl legislation on the Hill since before 2012. And the message is very consistent. We cannot, on the Hill, members of Congress have a very, very difficult time passing legislation generally, let alone about immigration, which is a hot potato, if there is any sense that there is controversy, even within the stakeholders. The stakeholders have to be unified in order for the bandwagon to march forward. We're not going to have allies unless we are all singing from the same hymnal, which is what we achieved in 2022 to pass the RIA. Yes, we had very strong and motivated leadership in the leadership in Congress, 100%. And I remain grateful for that. But we had enough of the a critical mass on the private sector side coming together with the key points um, in analysis, in advocacy, in order for 100 pages of EB-5 immigration legislation to pass. So if we want permanence, which is in, you know, in a sense, perhaps um, an even higher bar in a way, we really need to be together on that. I think that is quite enough uh, by way of a parting thought for today. And of course, I'll be speaking, um, I'll be addressing you all and in, in every other forum about um, permanent reauthorization, the need for us to all align on that right now. We're almost at the halfway point of the RIA. In December, we'll be right at the halfway point. And, uh, and, and so now, now is the time. As ever, if you have any thoughts, comments, please, uh, we welcome feedback. Uh, please contact us at contact at carolynleepllc.com with a subject line webcast or webinar, Investment Immigration Conversations. And we'll be sure to pick that up and, um, and absorb that as we plan our programming for the rest of the year. Thank you for joining me and have a wonderful rest of your day.